how great you are, sovereign Lord. There is no one like you, and there is no God but you, as we have heard from our own ears. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Now, my intent is not to be a cheerleader this morning. That's not my goal. I just want to run you guys through a really quick made-up catechism. We just read who God is, what he does. Let me ask you, do you believe God is the creator? Yes. Amen. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is his son? Yes. You believe Jesus died and was raised again? Yes. And that he sits by the right hand of the Father making substitution for us? Yes. Then let us welcome the Spirit into the room this morning. Commune with him. Glorify him for who he is and what he has done for us. What say you? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for loving us. Dear Lord, you are the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Help us to rightly put ourselves submitted under your authority, dear Lord. That is so hard for us to do. It is near impossible without your help. Only with your help is it possible. Help us, dear Lord, to glorify you and in glorifying you, bringing beauty, restoration, redemption into this earth where there is only decay, dying, but dear Lord, you bring life. You bring life to our souls, to our hearts, to our minds, to our bodies even at times, dear Lord. So dear Lord, we glorify you. You pray, we pray, and we all say, Amen. Amen. You guys need to sing this morning. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son. Here you go.
Welcome to Bellevue. So excited that you're here this morning. If you're a guest with us, we want you to feel welcome, and hopefully you got a bulletin when you came in. If you did, there's a tear-off connections card at the bottom. If you could take just a couple of minutes and fill that out with your information, uh, after the service is over, you can go out either set of double doors, and there's a blue tablecloth table there with a smiling person there who would like to give you a gift in exchange for that card just to say thank you and how much we appreciate having you here today. Let's take a couple of minutes and shake some hands around us and we'll continue to worship. If I could get everyone to direct your attention to the baptistry, we're going to celebrate a baptism this morning. It is a real blessing today to be able to uh, baptize uh, two ladies today. And uh, first, uh, welcoming into the waters of baptism, Mackenzie Knopfsinger. Mackenzie? This is Mackenzie. Mackenzie, are you trusting in Jesus and in Jesus alone for your salvation? Yes. Well, then, Mackenzie, upon your profession of faith in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, <laughs> raised to walk in newness of life. Well done. <laughs> Next, we wa welcome into the waters of baptism, Hadley Hayes. Hadley, there you go, there you go. One more step after that. Good, excellent. All right, Hadley, are you trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone for your salvation? Yes. Well, then, Hadley, upon your profession of faith in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> Proud of you, see? You did it. <laughs> there you go. What a blessing. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father God, we thank you so much for these two that have, have uh, publicly professed their faith in Christ today. And Lord God, we just thank you that we can do that. That we can place our faith in Jesus that we can know that we have a relationship with you that lasts forever, that your grace is upon us. And Lord God, we thank you for that. 
We thank you for all of us, dear Father God, that have made that commitment. But Lord, we also know that there's some here today that have yet to receive Jesus as their Savior. And may today's baptism touch their hearts in a way that they begin to think about Jesus being their Savior as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. From the Word of God, from the book of 1 Peter this morning, we find chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through the faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness, genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The Word of God. promises to reside in the praises of his people. Don't be bashful this morning. Come with full assurance of faith. Sing. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare your Sweetest of love. 
Father God, we worship you. We celebrate your holiness. We celebrate your goodness. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for the opportunity to express worship through our lips and also through the giving and receiving of tithes and offerings, the, the giving and offering of these things, Lord. I pray, Father, that you take these gifts, receive them, and use them to build your kingdom, Father. And Lord, as we give them, build your kingdom within us. Have your way in this service, O oh Lord. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hello, Bellevue Baptist Church. My name is Leland Stevens, and I am a church planter with the North American Mission Board's Church Planting and Military Communities Initiative. About two years ago, my family and I moved to Vicenza, Italy, to plant Glace Community Church, a church that uh, is designed to outreach to the local American military here, as well as into the local community if there are other English speakers that are in the area. Uh, now, you may be wondering, did he say Glace? Yes, it's, uh, it's a little bit of a weird word, but it's uh, designed to be a relationship word and it's designed to be kind of a conversation starter. And so glace is a combination of the word glory and grace. So our church is built on kind of this tagline, this phrase, if you will, that is for his glory by his grace. Now, over these last two years, we have seen God just do amazing things here among the American military. We landed September of 2017, and here it is September 2019 when I'm recording this video, and we have seen probably somewhere around 500 people attend one of our services. And so right now, we're averaging somewhere around 300 people on a Sunday, which if you know anything about church planting is just nothing short of a miracle and a, a, just a major movement of the Spirit in this area. Other things that we've seen in this area is we've seen over 30 young military members commit their life to Jesus and follow through in baptism, which once again, is just an amazing thing to behold, to see these young 20-somethings that, uh, that many of them have never been church before. We've had uh, some that grew up in the Catholic church and come to understand what the good news about Jesus is and submit their life to him fully. And so the other beautiful thing about being a, a church planting and military communities uh, church is we also get to send these individuals. And so now we are spreading the gospel throughout the United States and around the world through these young men and women who attend Glace. Now, just a, a few uh, months ago, we had a special visitor, or actually several special visitors, but one of them was Pastor Greg. And what you may not know is during his time here, um, he caught the vision of what we're doing, hopefully, throughout uh, Europe and has brought Bellevue Baptist Church on as a supporter of Glace Community Church and specifically my family and I. So we just wanted to make this video to give you an update and to say thank you for supporting us as missionaries. Take care. I'm so glad that you've been able to put a face to a name. You, many of you have heard me talk about Leland Stevens and Glace Community Church there in uh, Vincenza, Italy, right by our army base there. Um, I still am living uh, kind of in the, uh, the afterglow of my experience in Italy uh, with that church and with our military families there. And I, I hope that you grasp the kind of uh, real miracle it is uh, to have 300 people average attendance uh, with our church plant there outside that military base reaching military families our military families need spiritual shepherding need uh, spiritual nurture and the fact is is a great move of God is happening there 
in even greater ways than it's happening on the base through the chaplain's programs and things of that nature. It's absolutely amazing. And when you're in the midst of worshiping with these men and women of the Lord that are also American citizens and military families, the kind of appreciation that you have in your heart for them and what they're doing, because not only for what they're doing to, you know, uh, apply and uh, display force around the world that provides protection for our freedoms, but just the sheer family um, uh, sacrifices that have to be made for your whole family to move overseas and to be away from everything that you're familiar with and to, to, to have that kind of uh, unique experience of living on a base and things of that nature and uh, the unique pressures and strains on a marriage and on parenting. And yet here, you're being represented and you're supporting work that's being done. We're partnering together with Leland Stevens and we're reaching these people for Christ. And let me tell you something else that's so Amer a miracle. I got so excited when I got this video from him after I asked him for it. Um, when he was able to say that they were averaging about 300 people. You see, this summer, about 18 months, every 18 months, the turnover rate at these bases is just, I mean, everything shifting, moving, going, you know, deployments, different places, and what when reassignments, and they were going to be going through in July one of those major things, and the, the, the assumption was that the church was going to, it was already growing so fast, but it was going to really crash down low, and then have to be built up again, and that probably that would be the cycle, but what happened is, instead, um, the, all of that happened all of that rotation out happened but then when the rotation came in the church got bigger in just a matter of days and weeks because the gospel got out and people are so hungry to be a part of this church and so uh, aren't you glad to be a part of a church that's got its tentacles all over the world you know and is connected to what God's doing I mean praise the Lord for that yes and then I want to share this with you before we dive into the message because I don't want you to miss uh, kind of a moment we had in last, the last service. It just so happened in the last service, there were two men along with some other fam uh, family members that were of uh, the Congolese uh, people and, uh, from the Congo. And I don't know whether you know this or not, but uh, uh, more often than not in the, last, in the 915 service, we've been having some families from the Congo visit Bellevue for like a long time, for weeks and even a few months. And uh, they have been, been coming over here as refugees and asylum seekers, and they're in Owensboro. There's just a handful of these families in Owensboro. But in Louisville, there's like 3,000 to 3,500 of them that have been building. And there's this massive church that has been growing in Louisville um, off of these people that have come from Uganda and the Congo. And, and it's amazing what, what's happening. And we're starting to get some of those families in Owensboro. And once again, Bellevue and the people of Bellevue have been intersecting with these people and going, what's God doing among them? And what we're finding out is a lot. Many of them are believers, and they are, they are way want to worship Jesus. We even have one that wants to be a part of our, our children's, uh, I mean, our Christmas production that's coming up. I mean, it's so exciting. And so we had two pastors from Louisville come over. I got to have dinner with them. Some of you saw my post on Facebook last night. And uh, uh, Joseph and Emmanuel, and it is amazing to see their commitment to even partner with us to see what God wants to do in Owensboro among the people of the Congo, right here in Owensboro. It is absolutely amazing what God is doing around the world. And your church, you are a part of what God's doing. You're right in the flow of what God's doing. And that's one of the reasons why I just love being your pastor, hope to be your pastor for years to come, because we're the kind of people that we just go, you know, we just connect. We, we see, God, what are you doing? We, we listen and for the Spirit to move, and He moves, and how powerful that is. Well, today we're starting the second sermon in our series, Road Toward Victory. And you'll li that, that title for our series is really what life's about for the Christian. You see, for the Christian, we're on a road towards victory. we got heaven as our home and hope because of what Jesus did for us. Jesus has secured our victory and, and He's given us such wonderful grace. 
And so we have great hope for our future. But on the road toward that ultimate victory in life, there are challenges and difficulties. And what we'll see, and we'll, there are challenges like we talked about last week, high-walled challenges like the, the city of Jericho that needs to be taken. But then also there are those times that, like what we're going to talk about today, where along the road to victory we find ourselves in sin. But my message today is a message of hope, even though that the text that we're going to study is a text that's hard. But the message is a message of hope, and I've titled our, uh, our message today, Our Great God of Second Chances. Our Great God of Second Chances. And so what I want you to do is I want you to do two things. I want you to get your Bibles out. And if you don't have a Bible, use one of the Bibles in the seat rack in front of you and turn to Joshua chapter 7 and 8. And we're going to look at a lot of this. We won't read all of it, but we're going to look at a lot of it, summarize some of the rest. But I want you to look at Joshua chapter 7 and 8. And also encourage you to open up your Bellevue app on your mobile device and click your sermon note function on that Bible app, that, that Bellevue app, so that uh, you can follow along with the outline that I'm following here today. Now, um, as you're looking up that scripture, let me set up where we've talked about what we talked about last week. Because what we talked about last week is the, the fall of Jericho. And the people of God were to march around the city, and, and God was going to miraculously take down the walls, and he did, and they took the city. But God gave them a command. Do you remember that command? And that was to devote everything in the city to the Lord, to devote everything alive to destruction as a sacrifice to God and as an expression of God's wrath that he had prophetically um, uh, spoken over uh, those people for centuries. Um, their judgment day had come. And they were also to not only uh, offer up those things for destruction, but all of the possessions and treasures of the city were to be taken into the treasury of the Lord for the use of worship of the Lord and to give God glory. And that nobody was to garner a spoil from the from the city. They, they weren't to take the possessions and incorporate them into their homes and their own particular wealth. That would come later. That would come with success, successive um, uh, defeats of, of cities and villages. But not this time. The, this was all to be given to God. And, and it, what it was, it was a first fruits offering. It was a, an act of worship that says, God, uh, everything you're the one that is giving us the land. You're the one that we're following. This is really all about you. And so the first and the best goes to you. And isn't that how we as believers are meant to live our life? Is that the first and the best goes to God. It's one of the reasons why we, we, we tithe our financial income. Because we say the first, God's the one that provides this resource. And so the first and the best I give to him as an act of worship and acknowledgement that he is first and foremost in my life. Plus it's an act of trust that God will take care of me from here on out. And that's precisely what we see in this story as well, is that there was this, this commitment to, to say uh, God is first and he's told us to give and devote all this stuff to him. And what we're going to see is that someone didn't obey and we'll look into that, and we'll garner lessons from it. Now, the story of every believer in Christ is a story of second chances. God's grace translates us from death to life, from the, the power of darkness to the power of light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, from being lost to being redeemed. God's grace. And today's text talks about the story of sin and consequences and a second chance. So if you would, uh, look with me with chapter 7, beginning with verse 1. <coughs> I'll read aloud as you read silently. The Bible says, But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, that's a man, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. Uh-oh. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai. Ai is a, a, another town, another city, which is near Beth Avin, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, 
do not have all the people go up, but let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack I. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So about 3,000 men went up from the people, and they fled before the men of I. Now, why'd they flee? Well, first of all, notice a couple things here. Isn't it pretty much, aren't we getting used to hearing the, about the people of God right before and the leaders of the people of God right before they will go and enter into a battle? Don't they usually pray about it? Don't they usually seek the Lord and say, Lord, um, do you want us to go up at this time? Will you give us victory if we go up? And there's always this inquiring of the Lord. And uh, you see no evidence of that here. None at all. And then... What happens is they say, let's just go up. We'll go up, but don't send all the people. Just send up 3,000. We can take it. So what's happening here? Well, they're having all this confidence because of what God did in Jericho, and now they're feeling invincible. Invincible. And so they send out 3,000 men, but it's not enough. And not only is it not enough, God's hand's not with them. And so... What happens is, so the 3,000 men went up from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai. They started to lose the battle. And as they fled, the Bible says in verse 5, and the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them at the descent, and the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord. See, now he prays. And it's good that he prays now, but he didn't pray before until the evening, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to give us into the hands of the Amorites to, to destroy us? Would that we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. O Lord, what can I say? When Israel has turned their backs before their enemies, for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and <coughs> will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? And the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Get up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought near by your tribes. And the tribe that the Lord takes by lot shall come near by clans. And the clan that the Lord takes shall come near by households. And the households that the Lord takes shall come near man by man. And he who is taken with the devoted things shall be burned with fire. He and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he has done an outrageous thing in Israel. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel near tribe by tribe, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And, the, and, and he brought near the clans of Judah, and the clan of the Zerahites was taken. And he brought near the clan of the Zerahites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought near his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give praise to him and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, Truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar, and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. Then I coveted them and took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and behold, it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. And they 
took them out of the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the people of Israel, and they laid them down before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the, go- and the cloak and the bar of gold and his sons and daughters and his oxen and his donkeys and sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them up to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today, and all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones, and they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor. In chapter 8, verse 1, And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear. And do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise. Go up to Ai. See, I have given you into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city, and his land. We see they have the second chance because they reckon with the sin. Verse 2, and you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its livestock you shall take as plunder for yourselves. Isn't that something? Think about it for a moment. If Achan had only left the devoted things alone and given to God the first fruits, if he had only just bypassed what was God's and not taken it and gone ahead and followed the Lord right around the bend, right around the corner, they would have taken I and they would have been able to take all of the plunder there and be able to incorporate it into the wealth of their home and their family. Achan could have had it all and more. If he had just trusted God with what was God's and had given God his due. And the rest of the chapter, most of the rest of the chapter, they take I successfully. God gives them success. He gives it over to their hands. And then we see in verse 30 of chapter 8. At that time Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal. Just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the people of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones upon which no man has wielded an iron tool. And they worshiped there. They worshiped the Lord. You know, the story of our second chances always starts, number one in your outline, with our crime. The story of our second chances starts with our crime. We see it in chapter 7, verse 1. But the people of Israel broke faith. They sinned. How? Achan coveted and then took something that was not his, but was God's. God had commanded them to not take anything at all from Jericho, but to trust it to the Lord. But Achan took it. One man chose to disregard the command of God. And just before you and I get a little judgmental on Achan, before we go and point our bony um, finger into the face of Achan, lest we forget that we have an Achan in us. That all of us are like Achan. All of us have this tendency and this propensity to go and see how can we compromise things. All of us covet something that we know we should devote to the Lord or or we hold back from the Lord something that we know that we need to yield to Him. And we rationalize, as no doubt Achan had rationalized. This man somehow rationalized and convinced himself that the Lord was only speaking maybe in broad terms. He probably wouldn't mind or even notice if just one man took a few souvenirs from the fight. Or maybe it's possible he didn't even think at all, but merely coveted the possessions and his desire, listen to this, the desire, his desire for the possessions was stronger than his desire to know, love, honor, and please God. And my friends, that is what happens to us when we desire something more than we desire God. That is what pulls us into all kinds of sin is whenever we choose to desire something more than we desire the Lord who loves us and has given us life and has life eternal for us to enjoy. The story of our second chances starts with a realization that we've sinned, our crime. But not only 
does the story of our second chances start with our crime? It results in spiritual consequences. It results in spiritual consequences. That's what we see in verses 2 through 5. And what are those consequences? Well, the battle was lost, men died, and the hearts of the people melted. We must realize that our sin has consequences. Not only in our lives, but in the lives of others. Because, you know, a lot of us, we'll read this with our individualism shaping our view. And uh, with our non-communal perspective, and we'll look at this, and what do we do? We go, that's not fair. That's not fair. One man sin and everybody's suffering for it. One man sin and it's affecting everybody else. That's not fair. And you know what I have to say to that? What are you going to do about it? I mean, really, that's not fair, maybe, by your metric system, but that's life. You just look at this world. We suffer all the time because of something somebody else does. And people suffer all the time by the things that we do or fail to do. No doubt there are things that are lacking in our life that God wants us to have, but because someone won't follow the Lord, we're not going to be able to have that blessing in our life. We may not even know it. Likewise, when we commit the sin of omission, we're robbing somebody else. Or perhaps we, we do something wounding and wrong, selfish, and that steals from somebody else or creates ripple effects that wounds people and circumstances maybe even beyond our scope to see. It's important for us to understand. It results in spiritual consequences. We see in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, the Bible says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows in his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Our sin connects to more than just us, but to others as well. And so the story of our second chances starts with our crime, which results in spiritual consequences. But third, often it's producing confusion. Often it produces confusion. We see this in Joshua chapter 7, verses 6 through 9. What, 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 what confusion is that? Well, Joshua's confused. He doesn't know about Achan. He just knows something didn't work out right. And he's like, God, what's going on here? And until the Lord makes clear to him that there's sin in the camp, and you've heard, you've heard, haven't you? You've heard that phrase before, sin in the camp. It comes from this story. This is where that phrase in our culture, in our language, comes from. It's from this story. There's sin in the camp. But he didn't know there was sin. He didn't know what was going on. So Joshua comes in, he goes, man, the world's hard on me right now and on my people and I'm scared and what am I supposed to make of this? What's going on? Because he's not real sure. He's not sure. Is there sin in the camp? Or is God just this kind, kind of cosmic joker that's kind of led me good, led me well, led me well, only to kind of then trap me here in the promised land and wipe us all out? I mean, all these things must be kind of working through his head as often does to us when all of a sudden our life starts to fall apart. And it may be falling apart because of either our sin or someone else's. Oftentimes we can look at our painful circumstances and not make the connection of how our life choices or the life choices of others have impacted our circumstances. And we need to do that. However, stop for a moment. Time out. Let's just pause, put pause and pause the sermon for a minute and say something here 
not every difficulty in our lives is a result of some specific sin in our life that we're getting punished for. Or something. Don't go that route. The whole book of Job in the Bible fleshes that out, that we're not to go that route. The planet is just plain broken because of sin, and we will all suffer in a variety of ways in this world. Let's not be the kind of people that go, oh, so-and-so just got a cancer diagnosis. Let's kind of look and find what in their life they did that they must be getting punished for. That is not only not helpful, but most of the time there's not a connection there, except the fact that we live in a sin-broken world. We don't need to be making those kinds of maddening connections. However, there are times when quite clearly if we will allow the full process of God working in our life, we can see that there are choices that we make that make a pretty ugly rough bed to sleep in. And there are sometimes times when we have made our bed poorly and we are living in it and we are mad at the world and God for this bad bed that we're in and we're too prideful and blind to see that we made the bed that way. And that's what Joshua and the people had to see, is that they were responsible for the bed that they were in. But they were in for a period there, they were a little confused. And sometimes we get that way. We're so self-deceived that we're confused that we were responsible for the mess that we're in or for the fracture in our relationship with God. So we see in this story that the story of our second chances starts with our crime, results in, a spiritual, or in spiritual consequences, produces confusion. But this is the turning point in the story. Fourth on your outline, then God brings conviction. God brings conviction. We see this in verses 10 and 11. When God provides this method by which the people are going to be brought before Joseph and narrowed down until the, the person who committed the sin is found and convicted. It's pronounced, you're the sinner. You're the one. You're the man. Thou art the man. The sin of one man had impact on the entire community. You know, none of us are islands unto ourselves. We're all connected, as we said already. And here God brings Joshua and the people to a point of conviction, to a point of knowing that there was sin in the camp. See, there's no confusion now because there's been conviction. That's one of the most amazing, beautiful things about when people, and it can happen anywhere, but I've seen it many times in the church house, people fall under conviction. It's an amazing aha moment. They go, oh my goodness, I have sinned, and my sin separates me from God, and oh, I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King of glory, the God of holiness. And all of a sudden, there's just this, this clarity moment of where you stand before God, and it's not good. And it's a miracle moment. You see, conviction, when God brings conviction in your life, it is a gift from God. It's a gift from God in the same way that a diagnosis, a proper, accurate diagnosis from a doctor can be a gift to you, even though you go, oh my goodness, and you have a lump in your throat, and your palms are sweating, and you go, my life is on, teetering on some edge. But then, because of the diagnosis, there is something that can be done that saves your life. And the same is true about conviction of sin in your life. That when you come to the place where you go, I'm clear, I've sinned before God, He's holy, I'm not, I'm sinful, I need Him. It's in that moment of clarity that, wow, you are positioned for grace. You are positioned for God's mercy and his compassion and his forgiveness and his grace and the second chance that God wants to give you. Most of us run from the idea of being convicted for our sin. I know I have. But it is conviction that leads us to repentance and a refreshed relationship with the Lord. So we see in, verse, in, in the fourth point on your outline, then God brings conviction 
which number five in your outline, which leads to confession, which leads to confession. We see Joseph, uh, uh, we, we see here uh, Joshua looks dead in the eye, looks at Achan, and says, "What you do?" And Achan confesses. He confesses. What does it mean to confess? It means to agree with God on your sin. It's the first step to aligning with God rightly again. You know, when you're running, when you're burying the devoted things in the ground, when you're hiding it from everybody else, when you're pretending like nothing happened, when you are, are, are burying it and rationalizing it and denying it in yourself and lying to yourself and to God and to everybody else, when that happens, you are sick. And you are, no, you are there's nothing but hurt. There's no... There's no second chance to be had because you're still mucking up the, the first chance. But then, then you see clearly, and then when you agree with God, you're agreeing with God. You're coming towards God. And here Achan confesses, which means that's the confession that's applied to all the whole people, everyone. Everyone. You know, the Bible tells us to do this very self-same thing. In John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, it says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's confession that positions us for a second chance. But six on your outline is the hard part. And that is this, a cost is incurred. A cost is incurred. We see it in verse 25 through 26. I'm not even going to read it twice. I'm not going to read it again. It's this terrible scene. If we put it in a movie, we'd have to put a big R on it, and we wouldn't invite our kids to see it, right? Achan's sentence was death of him and all that was his. It's just, boom, gone, burned up. The New Testament tells us the same thing, that sin brings death. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the Bible says, the wages, the payment, the wages of sin is death. We deserve for our sin before a holy God, death and hell. We deserve the death of Achan, we and everyone that's connected to us deserves the death of Achan for our sin before a holy God. But that same verse in Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is someone who has incurred the cost for us, and that is Jesus. The Son of God, the sinless Savior, bore in his flesh, his body, the death we deserve. He was our substitutionary atoning sacrifice that died for our sins. He, he was taken to the valley of Achor. He was taken and lost his life to pay for our sin debt before a holy God. He was there to assuage the wrath of God that was certain upon us. And he absorbed that and consumed that in his flesh and rose again showing that he had paid that cost in full such that we would not have to die the death of Achan, but rather we could live the life of Christ forever and ever. That we would die, our sin would die with Christ on the cross. And that our righteousness would be brought alive in His resurrection forever. And our rightness with God would be based on His imputed righteousness. My friend, by God's mercy, Jesus has incurred your cost of death. The Bible is so clear about this in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, when it says, but... God showed His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died 
for us. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. And this is what makes our participation in the second chance possible. Achan didn't get to be a part of the battle at I. But God in His mercy and grace offers for us in Jesus the opportunity to not only receive mercy and forgiveness, but to be able to be restored to Him and to purposes. Seventh on your outline and completes the story is this. Going back really to the first step, the story of our second chances is all about our crime which results in spiritual consequences, producing confusion. Then God brings conviction, which leads to confession. A cost is incurred, and that cost has been incurred in Christ. And seventh, and finally, and restoration comes. Restoration comes. And we see restoration in chapter 8 in two ways. One, we are restored to purpose. Restored to purpose. The people of God got to go and continue to fulfill their purpose. And to take the promised land. But not only are they, they rest, were they restored to purpose, are we restored to purpose, but they were renewed in relationship. We see they set up the altar. They got to worship the Lord in freedom and in joy. And so the same is for you and me. We are saved by His mercy and grace from our sin and restored to our purpose and to our relationship with Him. So I ask you this day, what is it in your life that is wrong before the Lord? Where you need to confess that and say, oh God, I agree with you. I receive the grace of Jesus and I let you restore me to purpose and relationship. It may be that you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If that's you, then I implore you, I beg you, receive Jesus. He came to die for your sins so that you could have your sins forgiven and a relationship with Him that lasts forever. Come to Jesus. You may be somebody that came to Jesus a long time ago and sincerely did so, but you have been like Achan. There was something in your life that got you off track, that you... You took something that was not yours. You didn't give God something that, that He wants you, wanted you to give. You've not been rendering your service to Him, your love to Him, your worship to Him, your devotion, or something that you've been holding back. And after this message, the Holy Spirit stirred in your heart and given you a sense of real clear conviction that this is what you need to reckon with God about. And you can know this. You do not have to face Achan's pain but you can know the freedom that comes from Christ paying your price. And you may still have some unraveling of consequence because of your sin, but you can have forgiveness and grace and a pathway of walking in restored purpose and relationship with Him. Would you bow with me in prayer? God, we come before You in this moment knowing, dear God, that You have called us to mercy and grace you're the God of second chances, and we pray, dear Father God, that you would do something in us now. If there be anyone here in this room that's yet to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, would you stir in their hearts this desire to accept Christ into their life today? If there's somebody here, dear Father God, that uh, has wandered from you in some way, Lord God, may you call them back to yourself in fellowship with you and, and give them the grace and mercy of forgiveness that they might res be restored in purpose and relationship with you today. Lord God, do a work in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.